So we're, we're thrilled to have the Walkers Guild back again uh, for this great program on social media savvy, how authors use digital platforms to reach readers. Um, I realize that some of you may not be familiar with the New York Society Library, so I just wanted to take two minutes and um, let you know a little bit about us. We are the oldest library and uh, cultural institution in New York City, founded in 1754. And um, we are open to all. We are a membership library, that's how we pay the bills, but uh, we are open to all. Anyone can join us uh, for access to our reading and study spaces, events, um, our open stacks. We have 12 floors, glorious open stacks, um, and really fabulous collection. Um, we have a lot of programs for writers, writing groups, writing workshops, um, fabulous reading and writing spaces, um, and a great writing community here. And we serve tea every day at 3 p.m., so if you need a break, you can get some tea and coffee and cookies downstairs. Um, but non-members are, are welcome to join us as well for programs like this, for our public exhibitions, and our public reference room downstairs. Um, is um, we are happy to page books for anyone who wants to read in the reference room downstairs. So we encourage you to join us. And if you have any questions about membership or about the library, feel free to um, talk to any one of the staff members or just come in and ask for a tour. We'd love to have you. Uh, so now, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Diana Altman, also a very longtime member of the library that we are thrilled to have here um, on representing the Authors Guild. So thanks. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. I'm here in my role as Authors Guild Ambassador. What that means is that I'm responsible for planning events for the Authors Guild. This event, as Carolyn mentioned, is a partnership between the Authors Guild and the New York Society Library. So if you're a member of either, you heard about it. But some of our events are not partnerships with the New York Society Library, so you have to be a member of the Authors Guild in order to hear about them. For instance, the next program that we're, that we're going to do, if all goes well, and many things interrupt programs nowadays, but if all goes well, the next Authors Guild, Guild event will be a literary tour of New York where we'll visit the sites that are that uh, where Edgar Allan Poe lived and Walt Whitman. But you'll have no way of knowing about this unless you're a member of the Authors Guild. The Authors Guild is a professional organization, much like a union. It sticks up for us writers when we need protection. And the benefits of membership, some of them are that you get free legal advice and you'll have access to attorneys who review your publishing contract for free. The Guild also has a program to help you get your backlisted titles in front of people again. Hmm. And the Authors Guild will help you build your website free. These are just some of the benefits. It's best to go to the Authors Guild website to see if you qualify for membership. The Guild is open to ghostwriters, poets, translators, illustrators, and freelance writers. Founded in 1912, the Guild has about 14,000 members and is the nation's oldest and largest professional organization for published writers. I hope this program will inspire you to join. Now let me introduce Jane Murphy, our moderator. And it was Jane's idea. This program was Jane's idea, and she helped to organize it. So if there's any members of the Authors Guild who would like to participate in, in planning events or making up events, please come talk to me about it. It would be wonderful to, to meet you and to plan things together. So now I'm going to turn the, the, the program over to Jane, our moderator, and thank you all again for coming. Welcome, everybody. You know, I thought before we get underway and we all agreed, it would be really helpful if those of you who are writers could raise your hands. We'll take a little poll. Great. And keep your hand up if you've used social media at all. Okay. So not all novices here. That's great to know. 
So, you know, there are people who um, are allergic to social media. Some authors, um, they argue that they don't need to use it, that it's too time consuming, that it's something that they're just not comfortable doing. Um, but some of us have put our toe in the water. Um, still, we could be sort of overwhelmed by all the platforms and, and deciding, you know, what's, which of our books go to which platform or what kind of content to develop. Um, so, and even sometimes we're even conflicted about whether we should commit the time that they say is necessary to really engage on a regular basis. But not everybody's a naysayer. We have here a bunch of advocates and um, they can absolutely attest to the benefits of using social media. And today, tonight, they're going to tell us a little bit about their experiences, what's worked well for them, and maybe some things that didn't work so well. And, um, but I, I think they're very much advocating that social media should definitely be a part of an author's outreach to their to readers, to reach new readers and to have some kind of, you know, digital dialogue with their existing readers. Um, so uh, I think tonight also I want to remind you that after we're done in here, their most recent books are going to be available outside for sale and I'm sure they'll all be happy to sign them for you. And um, at the end of the presentation, we'll open it up for questions from you and if there's time, hopefully our panelists might even have some questions for each other. Um, so we'll get underway and we're going to start with Matteo. Anyway, Matteo is um, <clears throat> one of the National Book Awards five under 35 nominees and his debut novel, which is Black Buck, um, was one of Jenna's book club featured titles on the Today Show. And I read that and, and he confirmed that his new book is coming out, going to be released next year. And maybe, Matteo, you tell us a little bit about that and maybe what you think you might do for pre-release or launching social media for it. So yeah. you can start us off. Thank you. Hello, everyone. How are you? Yes. All right. All right. We got to wake up a little bit. I drove all the way here from Crown Heights, Brooklyn. Come on. Yeah. It's a little far and I drove on a scooter, a Vespa. So I braved the mean streets in New York City to get here. Um, anyway, happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, we're going to get into social media. The first thing I'll say is if you don't want to do social media, you're really not about it. This might be antithetical, but you don't have to if you don't want to. Right. Um, 20 years ago, there was no social media, you know, 15, 16, 17 years ago, there was no social media. But we are in a new world. So if you want to push yourself, if you want more readers, right. How many people here want more readers? Let's be honest. Yeah, come on, be honest. Like we want people to read our books, right? Sometimes when you come out with a book, you say, it doesn't matter whether it's one or 10,000 people, no. as long as one person reads my book. I used to get up on social media and say things like that when my first book came out. Now I'm like, that's a lie. That's a, that's a lie. I want as many people to read this as possible while maintaining my integrity though, right? You see people going on TikTok. Who knows about TikTok, right? Uh, I just got on TikTok and I was mm, averse to TikTok for a while because I thought that you had to dance all the time. I thought that everyone was doing the dances and I couldn't do that one dance when they go like that. And I was like, this isn't for me. Uh, I'm not gonna sell any books on this. I'm not gonna connect with anyone. Um, but the places that I gravitated towards and where I found community was primarily Instagram. Um, I found that social media the platforms are all different for me on linkedin of course i have people that i worked with um, throughout my early career working in sales and startups uh, people that i've connected business-wise from different conferences um, twitter is more of like a mix i'm not on there too much because i feel as though i don't want to just share my thoughts every once in a while and that if i have a really good thought I'm just going to turn into a book, <laughs> to be completely honest, or I'm going to try to sell it. Um, but I like to go on it to retweet other people and uh, be a good literary citizen. Uh, there's Facebook, which is a mix of like family and people that I sort of know or I knew from the past and people who we share differing opinions on politics and things like that. And uh, you know, you want to mute them. Um, and then there is Instagram. And Instagram for me was the place that I decided to live. Uh, the visual medium makes sense for me. Um, I like that you can have stories and share bite-sized 
uh, anecdotes or in bite-sized uh, pieces of information about what's going on. Um, I like the aspect of video and it just felt the most natural to who I was. But before I ever had a book, I started to compile a list of notes, uh, a marketing document of what I would do if I were to get an agent, if I were to get a book deal. I didn't come into this industry with any connections and I said, I'm going to have to push the hell out of myself and my book to to have readers, you know, to get it out there. Um, so I started to compile just a random list of things where my first book, Black Buck, is about a young black man. He's working at a hallway New York City tech startup. He gets there and he's like, hold up, I don't want to be the token black guy. Mm -hmm. So he hatches a plan to help other young people of color infiltrate um, America's tech startup sales teams, redefining what it means to be a minority in the workplace. So I said, all right, what am I going to do? What could I do? And I just started jotting down different ideas. I said, maybe I'm going to go into Washington Square Park and ask someone to sell me something or try to sell strangers and capture it on video. I didn't do that, right? It's just like that would have taken too much time. And I just didn't really like feel like it. I said, maybe I would have, I would commission illustrations of my main characters and then share those on social media and maybe people can share them. I did do that and uh, no one shared them. <laughs> They're beautiful. I really like them and no one shared them. That's something that didn't work out, but I was proud of it. And then I said, uh, does anyone who know who Ronnie Coleman is? Yeah, the bodybuilder, right? So I was watching a Ronnie Coleman documentary many years ago, and aside from just his massive bulging biceps, something that I loved is that one day a week, he would respond to all of his fan mail, you know, his emails and all, and all of that. He, he would spend hours doing that. And I said, if I were to ever get an agent or a book deal, I'm going to do the same thing. So when I did get an agent, when I did get a book deal, and I did find readers, I will start responding to just about everyone. And I still do today, um, as long as it's not weird. You know, like sometimes you get some weird stuff. And the reason why I do that, the main aim for me here isn't to just sell books. It's to establish a connection. It's to make people feel seen and not saying that you're obligated to, but it's to almost repay people for taking the time to read my work and support me. So if I get a direct message, if I get an email, I will eventually respond to it, whether it's weeks, a month, or even sometimes two months later. Um, the good thing about that is that you establish this personal connection where someone's like, oh my God, I read your book and now I'm talking to you and this, that, and the other. The con to that is that it opens up this door sometimes where you start to feel obligated to maintain these conversations. And if you're having dozens or a couple hundred of them at a time, you opening yourself up in that way could make someone be like, you fraud. Oh. You only responded to me once, right? When I talk about this, it, it's something that um, I would still, I would, I would still do 10 times out of 10 because for most people, they get that personal connection. They feel seen and you also don't have to respond to comments. You don't have to respond to DMs, you don't have to continue and maintain conversations because you are in control of how you comport yourself via social media. Um, so that, that works well though to establish this connection. Um, followers, cool, sort of important, not all that important. What matters more than followers is engagement. If you have 300 followers and 200 of them are engaged, um, that's better than having 20,000 followers and having you know 50 people who are engaged. Um, back in the day when I was working at startups and we talked about email subscribers and followers and we ended up realizing that those were just vanity metrics, right? Um, if people aren't taking actions, then it doesn't matter these numbers that you have. Um, and I probably have one or two more minutes. Uh, one thing that worked really, really, really well for me that I don't know would work today was Instagram Live. So I published my debut novel in 2021, January 5th, and we were in the pandemic. I didn't go on tour. And I said, why don't I just go on Instagram and start having Instagram lives, basically like this, where you know you can stream and people will watch. And I said, I'm going to turn this into a podcast show of sorts where anyone can request to speak with me. They can pop up on video, and then I'm just going to talk to them about my book, about whatever they want, and we'll have a rotating group of people. And it was improvised, 
And every Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern, we would have 30 to 40 people in there, people from the UK, people from California, people from wherever. And we did this for two months. And I never knew whether anyone was going to join, whether anyone was going to go live with me. It was nerve wracking. Every time I'd say, anyone want to go live? Anyone want to come on? And there was a good half, half a minute, 45 seconds where my heart was beating and then ding, someone would come on. And I'd like, thank God, how are you? And because the book had just come out, people say, oh my God, I can't believe I'm talking to you. And in my head, I'm like, thank God you're talking to me right now because I could be up here alone. Sometimes people would click to go live with me and it would be typically like, women being like, oh my God, I didn't mean to go live with you. <laughs> or like, like in bed or like something else going on. Then you just make a joke. You know, I found one guy, he was in his hot tub. Um, and these became like a recurring cast. That guy was hot tub Russ. And yeah, 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 yeah. So, so it worked really well to establish this community and this connection. And when other people would come live with me, say someone who was like, say someone who had a large presence, right, would come live with me, maybe they saw it, then all of a sudden the numbers would shoot up from 30 people to like 100. And these new people who didn't know me or know my work would then know me and maybe want to partake in my community. Um, so that's something that worked really well. I don't know if that would work today. My next book comes out next July. I'm probably gonna, not going to do that because people aren't stuck in their homes in the same way that they were in 2021. People want to have in-person um, experiences like this, so I'm going to push myself to try to innovate and do different and new things in person. The last thing I'll say that um, I'm thinking about for my next, my next book is how to create exciting and shareable moments for people. Shareable meaning that I am releasing something on across all social media, but you know, mostly Instagram and something that people can share to their followers that is exciting and isn't just like, you know, frivolous, like, hey, I painted my walls a new color. Here's the color. Want to share that? But uh, an example of this is last week we announced through the Associated Press that my new book was coming out. So I presented that it was an exciting and shareable moment and people shared it. Uh, the next milestone is going to be the cover reveal. Mm -hmm. Hopefully that will be exciting. Now all these people who heard about the book, we will put that out and it is uh, visually appealing. And I bet that hopefully I'm hoping that people will share it. Um, so I plan to continue doing that while not abusing it because if I'm coming out with a new update every day, every other day, it just turns into noise. So I'm, I'm especially careful on how much I share and what I share uh, because people's attention spans are shrinking and uh, attention is the most valuable currency today. I'm going to shut up and uh, pass it off. Not really. yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay. That's really good. I have lots of questions for you, but we'll leave it to the audience. Maybe I'll in a little bit. I want to introduce Claire McKinney. Claire is a PR and marketing specialist. She helps authors put together social media campaigns, including creating content for the different platforms, social media. Her new book, Do You Know What a Book Publicist Does? A Guide to Creating Your Own <laughs> Campaigns. It's hot off the press. I guess she doesn't even yet have a copy, but she does have postcards out there. So when you go to look at the books, get one of her postcards. Um, and you can tell us a little bit about what you do with authors. Sure. Um, well, I'm, I'm going to try to keep the microphone up here because that's how I know that you'll all best hear it, even though um, I don't think I need one, but just to be careful. Just to be careful. So uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my story of how I um, ended up here and, um, and then talk to you about a few of the things that I think are really important when it comes to marketing yourself online. Um, through social media channels and uh, other things. So first of all, I've been in the um, book world and publishing industry for over 25 years. I am old, but that is okay. Um, and so I've been here for the entire arc of the internet and digital media and Friendster and MySpace and Meta before it was Meta, before you know Twitter, now it's X, all that stuff. Um, and it was around 
I mean, I've always sort of felt, because I was a member of several author fan clubs when I was like seven or eight years old. Judy Bloom and Beverly Cleary were my two favorites. And I wrote to them and they sent me stuff and I loved it. Um, so I've always felt that author fan bases were really important and that that sort of community around an author in a book was really important. So um, with all of the digital stuff that was happening and given that I ended up in publicity, so I was doing media relations, strategic campaigns, bestsellers, working with dignitaries, academics, celebrities, all that kind of stuff um, for a lot of the big houses in New York. Uh, at one point, I realized that, that things were sort of splitting into two planes. There was this, the like cyber plane and there was the plane on the ground, which was what we call traditional and then we have digital up here. And that the same exact types of media were going to be available in both places. That is, you had podcasts, you have radio, you have you know live video or reels or whatever kind of Instagram, IGTVs, and you have regular television. I mean, these... The, the media outlets were multiplying like crazy. And then they were becoming owned by individual people because you're talking about social media channels. And later, you know, Meral, she's on book, she's book talk, you know, so, so all of these people that have a lot of influence. And I realized that for authors to be successful, they need to build an audience and the audience needs to be theirs. It's not great if your publisher has an audience and they market you through their channels. That's nice, but you know what? That publisher has 150,000, who knows how many other authors they're marketing. So it has to be you that's marketing yourself. And that's a big ask for an author. When I first started working with authors, in fact, before this became you know such a big part of our lives, um, it was really, really hard. You know, Some of these people, um, they do not want to share their lives with other people. They want privacy. Um, you know, and a lot of people thought it was just bull, you know. Um, I, I have to say that um, John le Carre, who um, lives in, lived in Cornwall, um, England, which is a very far away place that's kind of rough around the edges, he was not a person that liked to see others and it took a lot of convincing to get him to see a Time Magazine reporter who flew out there and drove up there and it was a long journey just to interview him after all these years of him writing spy novels. Um, but it is, it is a part of our world and it is necessary. It's not even something that I personally like to do because as a publicist, I promote other people. I don't necessarily like to talk about myself and put myself out there like that. Um, but like Mateo said, I don't think that if you hate the idea of social media, you just don't understand it, you don't want to deal with it, then don't do it, you know, really. And I think that that's probably going to be pretty consistent across the panel. However, if you do do it, then you need to start doing it right. Because, you know, when you have, when you're starting out, and I've worked with a lot of people who are starting from scratch, you know, no followers, no platform, you know, or they have a couple platforms, but not the right one, etc. They, um, when you don't have a lot of a following or you're not, you know, you're not sort of um, in the public view so much yet, you can't really break anything. You know, you can play, you can do stuff, you can have an ugly feed on Instagram, you know, you can do a lot of things. And it's not going to, you know, it's not going to kill you. But to have, to, to make a difference, to become someone of influence, to gather that audience, you need to think about what that audience wants and what you have to give. And what you have to give is unique to you. So it's not just your book that goes front and center. You know, I've got a book. Here, book, 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 book. That's nice. But it's not just the book because there are millions of books. What is it about you that connects you to that book, that connects that book to an audience, that connects you to that audience, and what can you give that audience that they need? You, that's, it's a big order in a way, but it's going to make it so much more gratifying when you're out there talking on social media with people. I mean, I have learned, you know, I used to hate Twitter, um, now X. Once I started doing it more and I developed, you know, I became sort of a micro-influencer. You know, I'm a company, so it's not the same as if I was, you know, like an author and no, I don't have to do quite that same kind of thing. But um, I realized that I have this loyal following of people that are great. I love them. You know, my Instagram following isn't huge, you know, but I love these people. They're book people. I look through my Facebook friends and I see all of these people from my life in publishing and, and you know, they're family members if I let them in, but, you know, the, the <laughs> publishing people and all this other stuff. And I, I mean, these are great people, you know, and, um, and I relate to them and I understand them and they understand me. We're a community. And so that's great. 
Um, but when you're marketing a book, when you're trying to get yourself out there and you want to be heard, you need to think about what it is that makes you and your book special. What makes you a differentiator in your marketplace is what we say in marketing speak. Um, I actually went out and got a master's in digital marketing a couple of years ago because I felt like, you know, I've been with this all this time in this stream of learning, but am I really doing it right? You know, let me hear from the marketers. You know, I have an economics degree, but it was a liberal arts degree. I don't have that business lingo thing. No, I do though, and I'll throw some at you if you want it. But I didn't have it, and I felt like there was a there you know, may have been a deficit. So I went to, back to school, and I got this digital marketing degree. And the one thing, major thing, I took out of there was the idea of differentiating and disrupting. And you know, disrupting in a world of reading is a little bit of a task, but differentiating not so much because there is something that you have that somebody needs. It's going. It takes some experimentation, and I hope other people will talk about that too. But it takes some experimentation, it takes some um, due diligence, it takes sort of understanding what you're trying to say, it takes saying it the right way, and it takes engagement with those people in real time. So sitting on your platform every day for half an hour, you know, hi, you know, like liking other people's stuff, commenting on other people's posts, finding people to follow, DMing people, you know, it's about building that world. It's a giant cocktail party, and you cannot stand on, in the corner. You know, you don't have that luxury if you're going to do it. So um, my work with people is always very strategic and it's always very, it's kind of a deep dive and, and digging deep. Sometimes people come and they've got like five things that they do. I'm a dog walker. I've written novels. I've written children's books. Um, I also uh, uh, am a part-time chef. You know, I've had people come to me with like five or six things that they do and I'm like, okay, so we're going to build something around you that is going to, to carry a message, you know, and, and we're going to carry those messages to the audiences that want to hear about it. And that's what's going to make it successful for you. So um, one last thing I'll say, and I think I should probably wrap it up. One last thing I will say is that it is not necessary to be on every single platform that's out there. Understand that. That's one of the big sides. See, I hear some sighs of relief. I'm so happy I can make you happy. Um, a lot of people, and, and I, you know, I resisted this because I was like, there's no way I can do all this, but you know, Know the demographics of the platform you're going on. For example, Twitter, now X, LinkedIn, they have a larger male demographic than Instagram. And um, Facebook, I think, is getting a little bit closer. I don't have the latest statistics on that. But Instagram is, tends to be more female. Um, and then the ages on Instagram seem to be, to be skewing a little older now because all the younger people are on TikTok. But then there is also Snapchat, and I do not, my daughter does Snapchat, I do not do Snapchat. Snapchat to me is high school, I cannot do Snapchat. But um, know the platform and, and find the one that's right for you. And I have heard this, I've been to content conferences where I am not around any book publishing people at all, just content entrepreneurs. And they tell me, you know, that they made their, they built their audience on Twitter, you know, Twitter exclusively. So it's fine. Find the thing you like and hang out there. So that's it for me. Jessica, Jessica, Jessica Leahy um, has books called The Gift of Failure, How the Best Parents Learn to Let Go So Their Children Can Succeed, and The Addiction Inoculation, Raising Healthy Kids in a Culture of Dependence. And I discovered online that they're quite widely quoted, which is a nice kudo. Um, Jessica, like many authors, speaks, she podcasts, she attends professional conferences, and it seems she leverages all of those experiences through her social media. She's also an expert at sustaining the sales of her books through what she calls reinvention marketing, which I hope you talk about because backlists are great. So we look forward to what you have to say. Thank you. Um, so I do, I co-host a podcast called the Hashtag M Writing Podcast. And we, my co-hosts are my former New York Times editor, actually turned novelist, KJ Delantonia, and my other really close friend, Serena Bowen, who is a best-selling uh, self-published uh, contemporary romance author. And so we have a really wide sort of background of the stuff that we've, I write nonfiction, KJ now writes fiction, Serena's over there writing the romance and self-publishing, but about to break into thrillers at a traditional publishing house. So we've got sort of a wide view and we talk about this stuff 
all the time. And I actually want to start where you finished, which is, um, so 20, I was a teacher for 20 years, middle school and high school. I taught Latin and English and writing and all that stuff. And um, I started out, um, my writing really was discovered through blogging as a teacher. And a lot of teachers blog so that we can share experiences with one another and know what's working and what's not. And some of you may not know this, most of you probably don't know this, but uh, as a profession, teachers used to be the largest users of Twitter. <laughs> so I started on Twitter. When Twitter was a place where the teachers, there were all kinds of teacher chats all the time. There was always a teacher chat going on. There was like ed chat and sat chat and kinder chat. And it was fantastic. So that was where I really built um, my following. I also knew that I wanted to be a speaker. So I knew before I published The Gift of Failure that I wanted to really pursue a speaking career. And so a lot of what I did, I loved what you said about sort of having a plan going into it because for two years before the gift of failure ever came out, I was, you know, sending letters and stuff like that, like like actual paper letters to heads of school and people saying, you know, here's here's why this would be a great fit for your school as an all school read and I come and speak and stuff like that. And I started to notice with Twitter as it became more, as I started gathering up followers on Twitter, mostly teachers and some journalists. I started a, I wrote a um, column at the New York Times for three years called the Parent Teacher Conference. And so it was that crossover of parenting, education, and journalists. Um, I started noticing that I could strategically use Twitter to make myself known at a particular school. So if I went and I found the principal, or if I went to a school's website, I could start following their teachers. And what would sometimes happen is a couple weeks later, I would get a request to come speak at that school. And so I found that I was perpetuating my speaking career through becoming known to these, especially once I got verified, um, which is not the deal with Twitter anymore. Um, and I was just saying, I'm really sad because yeah. Despite the fact that I have a fairly large following on Twitter, I think I'm saying bye bye. I think I'm leaving. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm leaving right now. I'm leaving my profile there because I don't want someone squatting on my name. But I don't know. I'm just not feeling good about Twitter right now. Um, and I, so I was a late adopter to Instagram. And I and you know Twitter was about the words, and Instagram was more about the pictures, and I was more about the words. And Twitter was where my my teacher peeps were. So why would I go anywhere else? Um, and then, of course, with writing nonfiction, I have to write proposals for my books. And in the proposals, you have to talk about your marketing strategy, your social media platforms. And, you know, we say that followers don't matter. And it's absolutely true that engaged followers matter way, way more than just followers. But if you're fortunate enough to have very engaged followers on any social media platform, it's such an incredible gift. And do what you need to do to keep them there by, you know, giving them, um, you know, for me, one of the most important things I do as an author is feature other authors on my Instagram, um, passing the microphone over to other authors, to people who have interesting things to say. I do a lot of, um, this has been a busy fall because a lot of people I really respect had books coming out this fall. So, and I have a favorite place where I always take pictures of, of books um, as they start to come out. And so I'm doing a lot of promoting other people's work on there. Um, but you have to be engaged, not as a, let me show you what I can give you, but as a, oh, I am so delighted by your success and the things you have to say. And this conversation is so fascinating. Um, I do a lot of, I love going to conferences and live tweeting them. I was just uh, lucky enough to go to the Research Society on Alcohol Conference out in Bellevue, Washington. I was holding on by my fingernails to the science because it was, it was deep dives into some stuff, but I live tweeted the whole thing and had a fantastic time. And all these people found me through that. So for me, um, I think I really want to echo what you said, which is that um, for a long time, Instagram wasn't for me when my publisher started saying you really need to sort of bring, get, you know, engage a younger uh, parent, and then that's where the millennial parents were, and so I needed to go over to Instagram. Um, but Facebook doesn't really do it for me. I still share things over there. Instagram has become my primary platform. TikTok isn't working for me at all, and I have some insight now after having a few conversations here. That's, but I'm also. Even no matter how many hints I get about how I can make TikTok work better for me, mm -hmm. 
I don't know that I'm going to do that because at a certain point, it's really important to say, well, nothing happens without the words on the page. I am a writer, so I can spend as much time as I want maybe engaging bigger audiences on TikTok by doing a lot of the wonderful things that you suggested, but at what cost? Um, and so for me, it's very much a balancing act. Um, I really want to do, I want to add one interesting side note here, which is that um, a friend of mine got a book, a wonderful book coming out called Genealogy of a Murder. Her name is Lisa Belkin. It came out just about, mm -hmm. uh, what, like six months ago. Fantastic book, highly recommend. I was sitting with Lisa Belkin explaining how much harder it is for me to get the substance use prevention work out than the gift of failure stuff. Gift of Failure is a New York Times bestseller. I get asked to go speak all the time for Gift of Failure. I don't really have to push that that much. But the substance use prevention stuff, I'm in recovery. I come from a long line of people who either need to be in recovery or are in recovery. It's, it is the, the book I was born to write. And so for me, getting this information out is about so much more than selling books. And yet, ironically, it is the subject matter that people are scared of or don't want to listen to or maybe don't want to go to an event out there and listen to Jess Leahy, the speaker, while she's talking about risk and prevention around substance use disorder. So I, I use a Trojan horse. I use my gift of failure events um, and where they dovetail this sort of shove that content in there. But my friend Lisa said, you know, if it's hard to get people to come to those events, why not use the fact that you enjoy doing video online why don't you use like Instagram Reels to give people the opportunity to digest that content privately? So I started making daily. I, I cannot begin to tell you what an investment of time it is, especially in the beginning, because it's like writing a column. It's always like, again, but I just did that. It was new again. Um, Today's video, if you go watch it, by the way, I did before I left for the airport this morning. So I'm like, yeah, I'm going to go out to the airport, but here's today's video. So I started doing daily videos on um, the addiction inoculation, and 170 episodes later, I was done, and I started doing the gift of failure. I will note that after a year of trying to get verified on Instagram and failing, when I started publishing daily um, reels, I was immediately verified. Mm -hmm. uh, so get, you know, staying in that algorithm, we were just talking about, you know, sometimes when you hit pause on these things, you can slip a little bit in the algorithm and then you have to decide, well, is it worth it for me to go back? But what I found for me anyway, I like doing the videos. I would not be doing them if I didn't like doing them. I like the 90 second format, it's kind of a challenge. What can you get in in 90 seconds? And a lot of people are finding me through those that video content. And I'm easing a lot of people into a difficult discussion. And so for me, I've had the experience of marketing a book that's about selling books. I mean, I believed in the book and I, you know, all that stuff. But for me, the addiction inoculation has been about how do I get this content that I feel is so important in front of people new people? How do I just help them understand what works and what doesn't work based on the research? And that's become what I'm using social media for now. Um, and that added, it's not just about the sales, or it's not just about the follower count, or it's not just about, you know, where am I ranked on Amazon? Um, that has been a really important part of this process for me, because it makes it about something bigger than me. And I find I'm just so sick of myself. Like, especially if you're making daily videos and I'm doing speaking events and, you know, I'm just so tired of myself. So it has to be about something other than, hello. I <laughs> so that's been really um, gratifying for me to build my audience based on something that I really believe in. So um, thank you so much for coming this evening. This is um, really a fun topic to talk about. And I could go on and on about it because I've loved I loved getting in there and figuring out what works and what doesn't and making the mistakes because I've made them. I have haters. I have had I've been attacked on social media. I've learned a ton about what to do and what not to do. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. Um, Moral, Moral Sadhar, um, she helps authors with their digital and social media marketing. And she's a TikTok and a book talk guru, I guess. <laughs> You're going to tell us all about it. Thousands of students have taken her tech training courses des designed for writers and authors, and I want to hear what you have to say. Uh, thank you for having me. 
I'm really excited to be here. So I actually started my social media journey in 2020. I have a children's podcast and it fe it's rewritten fairy tales, but they're inclusive. And I did a video in November 2020 and it was about um, the consent in Sleeping Beauty. And it got four, I think it got maybe 4.5 million views. And, and I think it was shared in so many WhatsApp groups. And I was like, wow, this is wild. I'm going to be famous. Uh, <laughs> but it only got me 2,500 followers and I was really disappointed and, and it didn't really drive that much traffic to my podcast. And then I started researching and I realized that, um, there was no call to action. I wasn't really talking about the podcast and I wasn't really sending people anywhere, but that those 4.5 million views actually um, help the algorithm and Instagram. So consistently I was hitting a hundred thousand, 200,000. And then I figured out how to kind of tailor the algorithm and, and then it moved over to TikTok. So there's one thing that I always talk about. Um, the first thing, whenever I talk about discoverability and how to get your content found, how to get your books found on Google, how to get your books found on Amazon, how to get your books found on Instagram, and how to get your books found on uh, TikTok. And TikTok and Instagram are my main platforms and Amazon. It's the algorithm. So I always start off is where would you hide a dead body? <laughs> <laughs> the second page of Google because nobody ever goes there. <laughs> so you want to make sure if someone is searching for your topic or your content or your genre or your type of book, you are one of the top 10 searches that show up. So there's ways to do that. There's hashtags, there's keywords, and then there's something called the algorithm. And so a lot of authors that I work with, um, they think that, okay, I'm on Instagram and they'll post very randomly and there's no strategy, but, but like, uh, Jane just said is you need to post regularly and have a strategy and then the algorithm will start picking you up. So once the algorithm start picking you up, I was able to get 200,000, uh, downloads to my podcast and, and, and it's still growing and when it talks with a company, but I also in 2020, what I started doing and I'm a mother of three young children is people kept asking me for book recommendations and uh, inclusive book recommendations and books that represented genres. So every year when it's Ramadan, I post books about these are books that you can read to your children about Ramadan. And those books became very, very popular because that's nobody, nobody knows where these books are. Mm -hmm. So I started posting and then those videos started going viral and then I was able to send a lot of people. And I got tired of just texting moms. So I started posting those on Instagram and TikTok. And then when I started moving over to TikTok, it was very interesting because the first video that I thought was so brilliant got me 20 views. <laughs> and um, and I was like, why, why, are, why are pictures of my six month old son leading to <laughs> conversions <laughs> of, 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 of my podcast or, or these books that I'm highlighting? And then that's where, I started watching other authors and that's where I discovered about the algorithm. So when you're on social media, especially Instagram and TikTok, there's something called the algorithm and you have to nail it. So the content that you click on and that you like is the content that's going to be shown to you. So if you're a children's book author, you're a children's book writer, make a list of all the accounts and follow those people and then start liking the content and start commenting on the content and then you'll see their content and then they'll see your content and then that's how you kill the algorithm. And I always tell people like if you see a cat video, skip it because that's going to screw up your algorithm. <laughs> or don't don't be tempted to go on TikTok and look at the really yummy recipe videos because that's going to screw up your algorithm. So just keep it very tailored and very specific in the hashtags. And, and we talked about being on social media. So a lot of authors don't, or some of my work with don't want their face on social media, and that is completely okay. You don't need to be on TikTok. You don't need to dance. You don't. You don't need to show your face every day. I have one author, and she became a best-selling author in the poetry genre, which is incredible because that is really hard. And she sold sixty thousand books through through TikTok and through the strategy called page flips, where she would flip videos and then she would just recite 
really powerful messages of poetry. And I think maybe she has like 400,000 400, followers and she got picked up by a traditional publisher. So, so that's kind of where uh, it can help you. But then also my background is also tech and I'm an analytics nerd. So what a lot of people will do is they'll post content, but they won't they won't check the analytics. So what what we were just talking about is um, if you if you see content and it's stuck at a certain amount of views, there's analytics for every single video. And you can see exactly what percent of people dropped off your videos and where they got bored. So there's this one video that I made. And I noticed that after 10 per, after watching like maybe 10,000 people had watched 10% and then it kind of dropped off. And I said, oh, why did they drop off here? And it's because I paused and was saying, um, and a lot. So then what I did is I re-edited that video. I cut out the um, and then it went up to 100,000. So, <laughs> so pe pe people get bored very easily. And then the watch, and then the watch time went up to 40%. So that's another thing is, is watch time. How many, how many seconds are people watching your video? Because what these platforms want to see is if you, if people are watching your content and they're watching through the whole video, then you're going to keep showing more people. So that's kind of, that's kind of how you, how you break out and you can repost the same content and Instagram is a little different, but TikTok, I love TikTok. And even though I feel like I'm a little old for it, I only see the content that I want. But in 2020, I think TikTok kind of, opened up the floodgates for book marketing and it's been instrumental in bringing back print bookstores uh it was the best i think 2021 was the best year ever for print sales and we're kind of still kind of holding on to that that theme from tiktok but if you post regularly and if you nail the algorithm you you will see the regular book sales you don't need to go viral you don't need videos with 100,000, 4 million views. I mean, if you do have 4 million views, then the likelihood of you getting picked up by a publisher is great. But you have to make sure that there's a call to action in each video. You can't just post a cute video and have a picture of your book and expect people to buy your book. So there's um, one author that we have right now. He used to be on a, a famous uh, medical show. And he has a serial, he has a serial killer uh, series right now, but nobody knows that he writes these authors. So we take clips of his show and we do this thing called a transition. Be like, this is the old me. We have music, close the laptop, and then close the book. And then people are like, whoa, I had no idea Dr. Benson had these thriller series. I need to go and buy these right now. And so his, his, number, his numbers have, have gone up because of that. So, and then what you do is if you see that only 8% are finishing the video, you're like, okay, how can I get this up to 40% and then get more people? And then at the end of each video, you need a call to action, which is, hey, I hope you pre-order my book because pre-orders are really important. And in the beginning, there's something called a hook because you're competing for attention like a couple of the other panelists says is you have maybe like one to three seconds to get someone's attention. Like why should they watch your video? Because you're competing against for all time. So if you nail the hook and you nail the call to action, you'll definitely get books. And the metric that I've seen is once you've nailed the TikTok algorithm, 100 views can give you like one book sale. And that's kind of what huh, I've seen. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so I think it's really exciting time for books. Uh, there's so many ways to to market. There's so many ways to reach your readers, and um, and and I think everyone here has really good ideas. So, so Hannah, on to you. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for coming. And uh, they include um, playing with matches and meant to be mine. She's also deputy editor of Lifestyle and Wellness at Bustle, where she covers topics from wellness to viral culture and astrology. And I was impressed to read that Hannah briefly worked as a matchmaker. <laughs> and I wonder if she's still putting people together. <laughs> um, hi. Okay. Um, thank you for having me. Thank you for that introduction. No, I no longer set couples up, um, but I did kick off my writing career to a degree. Um, I wanted to work in magazines. I wanted to be a writer, but I had sort of this brief detour um, when I was 21, working as a matchmaker um, for a dating company here in the city. And I had no training. I was terrible at it. Um, I met the most fascinating people, and my job is to help them get married. They were 
30s, 40s, 50s. I was 20. I mean, I knew nothing. I was <laughs> living, okay. Um, so I did that for about eight months, and then I left and I finished college and I started working in magazines. And I thought, okay, this is a wild story. Like, it's I just have a lot of weird things to say about it. Um, and so that became my first novel. It's um, inspired by that job. Um, and my career has spread from there, written a couple other rom coms. And I think one of the things that's been really helpful for me is that my social media really does connect with what I'm writing. So my books are often about dating and relationships and love. And so, you know, I post about my own dating life. I post, you know, interesting stories that I find online about different studies. Um, you know, there are always new studies coming out about, you know, the state of marriage in America today and things like that. Um, and all my books are pretty much set in New York. And so there's a ton of stuff that I post. You know, I know that my readers and followers are interested in New York. So it's a lot of restaurant recommendations and you know, events that I go to like this and promoting upcoming events and especially promoting um, other authors' book events in the city. Um, you know, just like cool, interesting, fun things to do in New York. So I try to tie in the things that are in my book to my actual content. Um, I feel like some other people here have touched on this, but if you are constantly just saying, buy my book, buy my book, buy my book, people are going to get really bored really fast. Um, they might buy your book at first, but they're not, they're not buying it every single time that you post that. Um, so you do need to have a lot of fun. And I think that like on a typical random day, I, I might not post about my books at all. Um, like right now we have nothing to promote. So it's like 95% me and maybe 5% my actual book. But you know, when I'm in a season of promoting the book, right, I had something that just came out, it's probably like 50-50 or it's like 75% me talking about the book. Um, and I think it's really important that if you are on social media, and again, like you do not have to be, um, but you can only gain readers on social media, it's not going to lose you any, you know, if you just like give it a try. Um, I think that you, uh, you need to sort of give the reader, give the follower, you know, value beyond just buy your book. Um, so there's somebody that I really like to follow on Instagram, him is that Palapu, and she's an entrepreneur, and she has written some nonfiction. Um, but the way that I discovered her first was that she just has this like really cool Instagram account where every day she posts five interesting things. Um, it's like usually news stories, or some commentary, and she has a lot of interesting friends who also curate these news stories for her. And she shares you know insights into her life as an entrepreneur and a mom, and she has a book recommendation. So her account was just really interesting to me, and so I followed her. And um, I think that you know I'm sure she sold a ton of books just based on being interesting on Instagram and being somebody that people are interested in. Um, and you know anybody can do that. Anybody can provide value. So I think. One thing I heard from her that I really liked was that if you are on Instagram, you should aim to provide at least one of three things. So that is inspiration, education, and entertainment. And so for inspiration, like for example, you might be posting a little bit about your writing routine. People love to see how other readers write, what the craft is, you know, where are you sitting? Do you have the same cup of coffee every morning? You know, you're always on the couch, or you know, where are you? People love to see that kind of stuff. Um, I sometimes see writers post um, prompts on Facebook and whether that's just like, I mean, I don't know, think of a, a, an open-ended question where everybody would have an answer or a story or something to share, you know, they drop it in the comments and they're not talking about their book. They're just being interesting and so people want to follow. Um, they're stirring up a conversation and so people know, like if I go on Facebook and I see this writer doing this every single day, like, I look forward to that and I want to respond every day. Um, and later down the line, that could translate to sales. Um, for education, it would be a little bit more like Pippa, who I mentioned, um, and you know she's providing news stories every day. Um, entertainment, like, you don't have to be dancing. I just mean you know like post things that are interesting to people. Um, so you know like I post things running around the city, but I also post about fashion and food and travel and you know all of those things that I like, and I just hope that my readers would like too. Um, so I think. Finding what to post about doesn't have to be that intimidating. I think if you just like look at the things that you're already interested in, hopefully there's some overlap with what you're writing about, probably, and hopefully your readers are going to be interested in those things as well. Um, I also try to find other ways to create value on social media that aren't just me, you know, posting about myself and my books. Um, so, for example, I have a lot of writers who follow me, a lot of young writers 
And so I created this Facebook group and it's like very basic, bare bone. I think it's just called like writing fiction with Hannah Orenstein. Um, that's how like little I have to touch it. I'm not like 100% sure what the name is. <laughs> basically like all these writers <laughs> join as they are talking to each other and saying like, hey, like I have a draft, 80,000 words. It's a romance. You know, here's a little bit about the plot. Who would like to be a beta reader? You know, like I'll read yours, you read mine. Um, and so there are all these posts of writers just connecting with each other. And I created that because I wanted a platform for you know writers to meet and connect, but they're doing it through this group that has my name on it, so my name is out there. Um, so that's like just one example of how you can create value. Um, I also work with authors and writers um, on social media consulting. So if you're looking for you know how to create a strategy or even just like what button to push, like what to write, like I do that too. Um, so we can connect after this if you're interested. But um, I think the other important thing about social is finding where your readers are. So like if you write YA, you should be on TikTok. If you do not write YA, if you write much any other single thing, maybe it's less important. Um, TikTok has a lot of romance and fantasy, but um, I mean, YA is also huge. Um, but I'm on Instagram because that's where my readers are. And so I would say just like as an experiment, go out to people who, you know, not necessarily your friends and family, but other people who are interested in your work or bought your books and just ask what platforms they're on. And, you know, if they all say Facebook, they all say Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, um, then you have a good starting place. And I think the more you post, the more comfortable you get. And I found personally, um, I don't know if you've had this experience with like other things, but when I put so much effort and pressure into creating this like perfect flawless TikTok, like, I, like a ring light and a script, there was music, it was a whole thing. Mm -hmm. I filmed many, many, many takes and it got like 10. It literally got like 10. <laughs> uh, and you know, I done like her makeup, like there, it was a whole thing. Um, and then one night at like midnight, I just had like a funny thought and I pulled out my camera and I posted it in six seconds and that's the one that gets a million views. Mm -hmm. And like, I was in my pajamas. And I think sometimes <laughs> like the things that just like, feel easy to you are the things that people like the most. And people, especially online, can smell desperation, they can smell like trying hard, <laughs> um, which is really unfortunate if you're sort of today like me. But I think the more that you can lean into being yourself and don't overthink it, just like find things you like, find platforms where you're talking to other people who are interested in the same things that you are. Um, I think that's where you can be most effective and you can create um, a following of people who are just interested in you as a person and therefore they're going to be more interested in buying your book down the road. Thank you. Um, well, I'd like to ask everybody here just one question and we'll go to the Can you give an idea that can you give an idea about how much time you spend every day on social media or preparing stuff for social media? Um, yeah, it really all depends on what I feel like, to be completely honest. Um, there are times when I'm on Instagram primarily every day for maybe like 15, 20, 30 minutes. Um, Hannah brought up when it's time to promote. When I have a book coming out, it's promo time, especially like the two months before, and if I'm lucky, two to three months after, if it's a long tail, you know, if you, if you earn that, and if uh, luck is in your favor. Um, but there are also times when uh, I'm done with it and I won't go on for three months, <laughs> like, you know, but it also doesn't have to be that drastic if you want to have a consistent presence. I find that, um, you know, like what we were talking about, the words and on the page, in my opinion, matter most. Um, having a connection on social media can help boost it. Uh, I probably have lost some readers <laughs> from being on social media, but I've gained a lot more, you know, like, like what Hannah was talking about. Um, but yeah, whenever I feel like it's too much, I might just take three days away. It doesn't have to be three months. Uh, so it just, it all depends, really. Yeah. Well, um, I personally, LinkedIn is a big channel for me because it's a uh, business to business and, and um, also their authors and stuff on LinkedIn. So I usually am on LinkedIn in combination about an hour a day. Now in terms of that's engagement, engaging, commenting, reading, posting, whatever. But we also, I we write a blog every week um, and uh, do, um, I, I publish a course um, for authors on uh, putting together their own press kit and coming up with their own um, you know, news items and such. For, um, for their media kits. And uh, so we're posting videos from that right now, but we generally 
um, work on that also. So we do a monthly content calendar, and then we also do a weekly schedule. So you can get you know pretty far into it. And um, I have a person in my office who spends about fifty percent of her job doing this with me. Uh, the video eats up time, so I, you know, I have to make the videos. I've gotten much faster at it. I had to do the captions and put my watermark on all this stuff, and then so once a day, I do all the uploading to all the platforms. Um, for the, I also host this podcast, the hashtag Am Writing Podcast, and we are so lucky in that we have enough support now that we do have a social media person, Natasha, who's brilliant and wonderful, and she makes the Canva cards and she, you know, does that kind of stuff. Um, I'm on one of the things that has worked for me as a writer in terms of getting eyes on my work is doing a lot of podcasts. And so I try really hard to publicize other people's podcasts when I'm on them. Um, and I can't do all of them, but I try to do that. So that's a big time suck. Um, and then, you know, there's just the fun stuff I do because I saw this cool place and I took a picture of it and I thought it was really cool. Um, so. For me, I have to work really hard to balance the amount of time that I spend on there because it can very, very quickly get out of hand. So I create a monthly plan for all my authors, and then I spend just Mondays um, with my team queuing up everything. And now TikTok has a feature where you can schedule Post, which I think is game changing. So you don't have to be on the platform every day. And because I did realize when I first started, I was on social media every day, and that does take a toll on your mental health. Um, I, I, and especially when you hit a hundred thousand views, two hundred, the haters come after you. Yeah. They're like, "Why should children read books about other people, <laughs> not like them?" <laughs> or there's that crazy lady again. And they're like, "Okay, chill out. It's okay." But um, so yeah, so. I set aside, but when one of the children have a holiday on Monday, it was just freaking out. I was like, oh, I lost that Monday to do social media. So it kind of screws with schedule. But yeah, but, but pick a day, make the plan for the month, queue up everything, spend, and usually we just record uh, the two hours. So our authors give us a lot of material too, and we just kind of cut through it and, and have everything posted and ready to go on Monday. And then it just spans out. And then the rest of the week, we just like train the algorithm, like just searching hashtags and, and, and it's like pretty easy selling. So that's kind of what works for my, my team and the books and stuff that we're doing. Um, I typically post, I post pretty much every day. Um, usually it's like, I, I mean, I'm most active on Instagram stories. So it's not really the pressure if I'm with like perfect photo and making it look really, really nice for your Instagram feed or your grid. Um, stories are just a lot more casual because they expire within 24 hours. And so usually I'm just snapping photos of things throughout the day. So like I took a picture of the library outside. So after this, I can post, you know, I was at this event, or, you know, here's more about the event. Um, but I'll tag you. I will tag you. Do you have to recognize Yeah, and tag everybody. Tag people. Yeah. In your tag books. people yeah. in places, um, organizations, libraries, even your public, especially your publisher, because like then, it needs just one click of one button for them to then be posted it on their own account. Um, so usually if I'm snapping photos during the day, I'll usually spend, you know, a couple minutes like in the morning or, you know, maybe twice a day, like one at night, and I'll spend maybe like five or 10 minutes total uh, just putting those together. Um, if I have something that's a little bit more involved, I will, it, I mean, it could take like up to an hour to post like a series of really, really thoughtful things, or if I'm, um, you know, just editing together a lot of photos, like that might be longer. Um, but yeah, it doesn't have to, I mean, it doesn't have to be crazy. Um, also, I think one thing that's really, really helpful that I do both to help me in terms of consistency, but also to help followers stay a little bit more engaged is I just create series. So I, I know what I'm going to do and I can just like iterate on it forever. So I'm always posting about my writing routine. Um, I don't do this anymore, but for like three years, I was posting daily writing updates. So there, I had a little template. It was really, really easy to fill out. And it was just the date how many words I wrote, the total word count, and notes from the day. Like, it was really easy or hard or like a tip that I figured out. That's such a good idea. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> and I have my name on it. So um, people took a screenshot and did their own templates. Like, it's I have my name on it. Um, and I never had to think about, okay, what do I post today? Because that was there. Um, or this summer, I took a picture of the sunset every single day, and I rated it based on how pretty it was. <laughs> <laughs> 
was really like nature, it was like sunsets. And so people were messaging me all the time, like, hey, like, did you get Tuesday sunset up? <laughs> 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 um, and so I mean that's so silly, it's so stupid, like who cares about the sunset, but that created this community of people who are now engaged. And so that took maybe one minute a day. Oh. A little bit of that's great. more questions, but let's open up here. Uh, two platforms. I was wondering if you guys have any experience with Substack and YouTube, because my family is on YouTube all the time. I can't believe how much time they have Can I hit the Substack one? Yeah. We did a whole episode with Liz Lenz, who's, if you want to follow anyone on Substack, please come follow Liz Lenz. Um, uh, Liz is just a fantastic writer, number one, but she was the person who introduced us to the idea of, you know, obviously the way Substack works is you can write there, you can get people who will pay for your, your you can have some free stuff, you can have people who will pay for additional content. Our podcast is hosted on Substack. Um, it, we were one of the first podcasts on Substack, and, and it's just, it was an easy way for us to put that up on the platform. But, you know, the nice thing about Substack is that Liz is like, look, some months it's the difference between me paying rent and me not paying rent. That money that, and the nice thing is also, I, as a reader of Liz, I want to support Liz. Of course I buy her books when they come out. But on top of that, here is a very real way that I can say, Liz, I love your writing. I support your writing. I want to be a part of your audience. And you're providing stuff that is worth it for me. And as a writer, when you have people who you know have invested in you, and this comes from a podcasting perspective, you want to provide bonus material and special stuff. Like, thank you to my supporters for, for, um, for supporting us, giving us actual money to create this thing so that we are not paying out of pocket for it or not just, you know, writing into the wind. It's a really amazing way to in a very real way, feel connected with some of your favorite writers. So whether it's something yeah. or some other, you know, whether it's, there's lots of different places you can do it. I happen to think that Substack is a fantastic way to connect with other writers and your audience. Um, regarding YouTube, um, one thing to consider with YouTube is that it's not a social channel. It's actually a destination. So it's similar to if you were going to embed videos on your website. Um, they accept that YouTube has, you know, people who go there, obviously, are looking for videos, but you are competing against, you know, all of those people that are already on there. So a lot of the rules of creating stuff, like everybody's talking about here, they apply, but you will still need to generate that interest and send people to watch your videos and subscribe. So I, we cross post everything to YouTube. Oh, sorry. I cross post everything to YouTube Shorts which they're promoting because they're trying to compete against um, Instagram Reels and TikTok. So if you want to just try, out, try it out, just cross post to YouTube Shorts and, and it'll get more than just regular YouTube. YouTube requires a tiny bit more time investment if you're doing video than Instagram or it's just a little bit more complicated. But. Have you found any tool um, like a Hootsuite that allows you to um, post effectively across platforms? Because once you have different people, the same person will have different handles on different platforms. So if you do use Hootsuite, you're probably likely missing some of the same people who you're hopefully tagging. So I'm just wondering how much of a manual process does this always come down to be across platforms? Or have you found some secret sauce that we should know about? Um, well, as an agency, we do use, we've tried several of those scheduling types of um, platforms, automate. Yes, we, we Anchor was the one that I loved the most. Oh, we Anchor. Well, I liked Seismic, which really dates me, and the Hootsuite bought Seismic, and um, I do not like Hootsuite as much, but we do that after going through several, we have landed on Hootsuite. Um, the thing about it is that, um, it's, uh, it, you know, we use it with our clients a lot of times, but now that the individual platforms have made it easier, like what um, Mirel was saying about posting on, um, on uh, TikTok in an automated way, it's made it a bit easier. But um, Hootsuite, you just have to watch it. You, you really have to almost do double duty because it's posting, yes, and you, you have to make sure that those posts actually appear, and then you also have to do your own analytics. Um, it's very expensive if you want to actually buy into any, um, the service where you can actually see how things are doing. So um, the, it's not a one size fits all. Also, the minute you automate anything, you're you run 
the real risk of posting inappropriate things at inappropriate moments. Mm -hmm. um, when I was a writer at The Atlantic and The New York Times and The Washington Post, I wanted my evergreen content going out on a regular basis. So I was, I had in the Edgar, I had a database and I had them all timed out. And I had to be really careful because if, you know, right now we're in a period where like, you just don't want to be complaining about stupid crap right now. So I'm not going to post right now about how bummed out I am that I ripped the hem on my whatever. So you have to be really careful with automated stuff. And people see through it fairly mm -hmm. quickly, um, especially if you're posting at the same time or whatever. Just be really careful with automated posting. And then I would say make sure you remove the watermarks if you're cross posting. Yeah. 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 Because if you if you post a TikTok watermark on Instagram, they will Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Question. Um, and perhaps um, two kind of basic questions about vocabulary. You, uh, some of you mentioned being verified on different platforms. So I wonder what does that entail and what do you do? <laughs> and the second, also simple, I think you also mentioned having call to action embedded in your various posts. I'm assuming that's a link to a sale or a pre sale, but how does that work? And how do you track the information? Well, I mean, I can speak to the verified thing. It used to mean something on Twitter because it used to mean I am who you say I am, and you can trust that it's really me. Uh -huh. um, and because they, you have to have, they have a driver's license and blah, blah, blah. Same thing with Instagram. Mm -hmm. um, but now a blue check mark on X Twitter doesn't mean that anymore. And so that went down the toilet. Mm -hmm. um, but there are extra things that you get um, when you're verified uh, on Instagram. And I haven't fully taken advantage of those. So I'm going to defer to other people on that. But. I wonder about verified in general, like on Instagram. If you're a person who writes fiction, I don't know that it matters so much if you're verified. I mean, that's. That's like a lot for celebrities so that people know that this is the actual celebrity because they're verified. But for most of us, it's not that big of a deal. For you, it is a bigger deal because you write prescriptive nonfiction stuff. And, you know, so that's that's a little different. Um, the call to action, I know um, Muriel talked about that too. Um, uh, why don't you just hold that? So the call to action, what, um, what a lot of people don't realize is that people don't do things until you tell them to. You can give as many people your book. Um, and there's a book that we have, but they published like book one of the series a year and a half ago, but the reviewers weren't posting. But then they saw one of the TikTok videos and we messaged them like, oh, by the way, thanks for your review. And they're like, oh my God, I totally forgot to write reviews for the other books. And then they went on and wrote them. So a call to action is basically telling someone that's also fits naturally with the story is, hey, follow me for part two of this history lesson, or um, follow me for updates about when my third book releases, or um, sign up, go sign up for my mailing list. But then there's also things that can suppress your content too. So you don't want to say link in bio, you have to spell it out and use the asterisk so the, the platforms don't figure out that you're trying to send people to the link in your bio. So it's not you're not allowed to put the links in the content on some of the Yeah. It gets yeah. sneaky. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just, it, a call to action is basically just telling people what you want them to do because on social media, you have to be explicit. No one will write through you unless you ask them. And you oh, follow them. Okay. I mean, here's, here's the thing too about the social media stuff. Um, we actually uh, published a blog post a few years ago that was very successful that we just updated and tried to publish on Instagram. And you know, as a business, we do put a little bit of money behind um, our blog posts when we post on Instagram. And this one was about um, marketing your book on TikTok. Mm -hmm. And um, guess what? This was considered not strong content <laughs> by Instagram. <laughs> and we publish blogs every once a week, you know, and on all kinds of things, AI, you know, all kinds of, you know, writers, tips, whatever. And I'm all, I mean, having researched this problem, I found that, yes, the problem is that Meta is not going to promote another service. Mm -hmm. okay. So yeah. even though I'm paying for the ad, no. And they're not going to tell me that's why it is either. So like we were saying, there's some little weird backdoor things. And so you find them as you work at the platform. Yeah, and don't mention the platforms. Yes. Yeah. That's Can I yeah. underline one thing you said that's really, really important? I tried the experiment where you said that if we want 
uh, TikTok to show your content to other people. You need to be watching content in the content that, okay, so I, uh, Serena Bowen on my podcast co host told me about this. And so I'm like, fine, because I don't want to watch parenting content when I'm not <laughs> working. So I want to watch the cats. But I tried it. I was cooking. And so literally, I had my phone next to me and I was swiping through hashtag parent, blah, blah, blah. And it so works. Like for a very short period of time, my videos were definitely being shown to more people. But, you know, again, what's the commitment? Like, is this fun for you? Do you want to commit your time to scrolling through, you know, while you're watching your bread rise, scrolling through videos you don't actually want to watch just so your videos are going to be shown to the people who you want them to be shown to? Yeah. Yeah. Brogan, a question from the live stream audience. Um, actually, these are two sort of connected questions. Um, I think from a marketing standpoint, if an author doesn't have any social media accounts and you plan to run organic and paid campaigns, do you recommend starting accounts branded with the book title or with the author's name first? And another person then says, following on that, do you have any recommendations for how to start from zero in social media once you have chosen a platform? Well, yeah, that's, that's what I do all the time. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's a, it's, it's, I, I love working with people who are starting out. And um, the first question is about wanting to run a paid campaign. I think that was just paid was the question, paid and organic or just paid? Organic and paid. Okay. An organic campaign is going to be tough to do if you haven't spent some time already on social building your platform because you, you aren't, if without a following, you aren't going, your content isn't necessarily going to be seen by a lot of people unless you're on certain platforms doing certain things, which, you know, like TikTok or something, which I think is a platform that is, you know, it's not, it's a, if you're not, if you're totally new to social media, it's maybe a little trickier. I personally think for, for TikTok, but but I don't know your situation, so I can't tell you exactly. Um, paid, you can all you need to do is have a um, Facebook account and um, and then an Instagram account that are linked, and the Instagram account needs to be a business account, and then you can post um, things um, on Facebook. You can boost boost posts. You can do things like that. Um, there's a whole backend ad manager on Facebook. You just need to basically be in Facebook, have a page that's somewhat designed um, so that you're actually representing your brand um, in, the, in the style and the way that you want people to perceive you. As far as your book title or you, um, my experience with social and what I recommend my clients is that you should use yourself in most cases because people identify more with a person than they do with an object. So that would be my answer to that question. And I'm just gonna add to add to your um, answer. So I would do a combination of organic and paid. Like when you're doing the first week or the first two weeks, you'll get good analytics. And if you see something that's performing organically really well, then you want to boost and you want to spend the ads and and get more stuff. Because if people are saying, "Oh my gosh, I didn't know. I definitely need to buy this book," or "This sounds like a really cool story. Where do I find the book?" So boost boost what's already organically performing well, and that's the content I think is also best. And don't just buy Facebook ads. You have to look at, there's some targeting stuff that needs yeah. to be done in there. I mean, targeting means like, who do I want this to be shown to? Don't just like go and hope that it's going to be shown to everybody. Well, and, yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the ad process is a process that it's a process. All of these things are processes. Like even when Noel says, you know, you should target things for, for organic reach, it's still a process. You still have to write, you know, put the content together, figure out what you want to say, figure out whether it connects to, to all of your book and you know I mean it can be simple too like what Hannah's saying but if you're not anywhere right now and you don't have name recognition in any other space like traditional media if you're somebody who is seriously starting from scratch then you probably want to take some like little tutorials on the free free courses and things like that over with a professional who can help guide you a little bit as you get set up. Anybody I have another question here if you don't mind my throwing my name uh, one of our live streamers says, hi, my name is Barbara. I've spent most of my writing career in one specialty area of journalism, writing for major newspapers, but recently I wrote a children's story for ages five to eight or so. <laughs> Which of the platforms mentioned are best to reach parents of children in that age group? 
And should I create new accounts on social media platforms that are totally separate from my normal specialty or try to build on what I already have? Thanks so much. Um, I would say Instagram. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, that, definitely yeah. Instagram. Definitely um, Instagram. The, kid, the kids' audience is a lot harder uh, to find. Like, you'll find a lot of mom content on TikTok, but it's humorous mom content. Uh, definitely Instagram. And test it. I would say test it. First, um, do, do a couple of posts. Do an intro video about the story about why you wrote this children's book. And, oh, I've historically, and this is... You won't believe, start with a good book, you won't believe what I just switched into. Mm -hmm. And then say, I, and then say something about the revelation and then tell your story and then get people interested in, in your book and then test the metrics and see how that performs. And if that works, it's going otherwise, I think you can start a new account. I also wanted to mention that you can search for teachers of Instagram and you'll find that you can actually, you can ask teachers if they want to review your book, especially if it's elementary level, which it sounds like it is. So um, you can uh, actually work with them as influencers and have you know some earned media, which would be publicity free um, if people will review your book. So that's just a little added thing. School library journal, teachers, school librarians. I mean, this is, I'm going back to the TikTok audience, I'm sorry, the Twitter audience, but like, oh my gosh, I used to teach in an inpatient rehab um, for adolescents and I would go on Twitter and I'd say like, can you need a book for a kid who's, you know, 16, but reads like around the fifth grade level and only likes basketball, go. And I would get all of these incredible <laughs> recommendations on Twitter. It was amazing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, just um, one last question. What if you're an author and you hate being on the videos and you know it's a good idea, but for instance, I'm a children's author and I don't want to, I just don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. I'm on Twitter X and Blue Sky and I've, I've tried them all, mm -hmm. but videos to me, it's painful. Mm -hmm. but you don't have to be in the like Some of the coolest videos I've seen, um, so I mentioned Serena Bowen, who is one of the co hosts of the podcast I, I host. She has um, lots and lots of her readers will make videos of her books, like, and it'll be like you can get stock footage of all kinds of stuff, put, and weave together these great videos, and you don't have to be in them. Like, her, she writes about like contemporary uh, hockey romance, and there'll be pictures of players and pucks and a handsome man looking at another handsome man, you know, and she's not anywhere in them, but it doesn't matter. It's about her content, and it's creating a world and an excitement and engagement. So, um, I... Ch the children's book space is my favorite space. Uh, I you don't have to be in the video, but you can show your book and do page flips and do readings, and but just make sure you you consistently post that content because if you post the page flips in the books, um, the algorithms will say, hey, that's not. If you distract or if you post some other types of videos, they'll get confused. So I've known authors who've gotten tons of followers and people interested in the book just by reading the page web. And one of my most traffic readings, um, I don't know if you're familiar, but um, Ludacris does uh, Llama Llama Red Pajama. And I was reading it to my son and he loves it. Like he dances to it and they have a dance party. So we, we turn the, the audio on and then we're just flipping to the pages. And that got like 2 million views. And I mean, the author got a lot of, um, Got a lot, got a lot of sales. I'm like, oh, we didn't know about sales. Are really didn't know about blah 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 drama. And then I think Ludacris like retweeted it too because we tagged him. But uh, but just the page flips, and then just having creative sounds and just fun ways to just like contact. Yeah, I wanted to mention that um, that I've been told by people who specialize in like advertising and things on TikTok that it's a sound medium. I mean, that's it's the sounds that are the things that trigger, you know, things. So you can play a lot with the sound thing. Um, and like she was saying, with the page flips and the readings and add some sounds and, and you're all set. And it's, it, once you get the hang of it, it's not hard. And then your dog will watch. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? I just had one that you could end up. Um, my, uh, I have one about humor. And, and whether you ever consciously use humor, a lot of humor has come out from what you've said, 
But humor apparently is a terrific ingredient in the mix for social media. So if you have anything to say about humor, um, if you're built for it, yeah. And, and if you're not, try. But you need some thick skin, you know? There are some things that I post on there that, uh, like Ken was saying, a little midnight video that I think is funny, and I get like 50 DMs about it, you know, because it's, a, it's a primarily a story. And then there's other things that I posted that I thought was funny, and <laughs> there's like crickets, you know? But you have to be okay, and, and also knowing that things are going to hit and miss. And sometimes it is about the content itself, and sometimes it's about the algorithm, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and, and that not being in your favor. But I think um, sincerity often wins, um, being genuine often wins, and being proud of what you share, regardless of whether it's humorous or, or a post without your face or your video, you know, um, even though you're very bright and delightful, so, you know, I would encourage you. Um, but yeah, just like sincerity, being genuine, and um, trying not to wrap too much of your value as a writer or a person, whether someone is commenting or liking, uh, I think that's important. I looked at it really quickly that there was a day when I was, um, I'm just really tired of myself and my writing and I wasn't feeling it. And I knew I needed to write something just for me, something that made me laugh. And I wrote a post about the fact that my kids had forgotten how to do their laundry. And so I took a dry erase marker and I wrote outside my wash on the all over the outside of my washer and dryer with dry erase marker, all the instructions in a very funny way. Like, no, 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 stop. Are your underpants still tied up in the legs of your jeans? I did that. Okay, now you put it. Stuff like that. It was just really silly. And there was a picture of my dog looking like she couldn't stand the smell of my son's pants. You know, that kind of thing. By far the most popular post I had ever put up anywhere. Whirlpool got in touch with me. And they're like, what is this? And I wrote it just for me. I expected it to be this silly thing. And it just, people when you're there because for the love of the thing and you're happy and it's enthusiastic and you're invested that tends to be what it is that's right now that's i was just going to add if you don't know what to say or how to say something the way that you would text a funny thing to your best friend like that's so much better than anything yeah. that you're like you know just like staring at the computer rewriting it for 10 minutes just like how would you tell this to your friend and that's what people connect with thank you everybody it's been great thank you all.